Hello, my friends. It's Menopause Taylor, and it's that time again. It's time for you to have a stroke of good luck and learn more about menopause. In just the stroke of a few minutes, you'll know a whole lot more than you do already. And I hope that today's lesson doesn't give you a stroke. I mean, quite the opposite, because that's what I'm going to discuss today, stroke. I'm going to help you avoid ever having a stroke. This is still part of our unit on heart attack. And as you know, I cover everything in the world of menopause. I talk about everything there is to do, has to do with menopause. And stroke happens to be a very big topic in the subject heading of menopause. It's a big, big deal. And you know, I've noticed that people tend to worry more about one disease or another for various reasons. I mean, Sometimes they notice and worry most about the diseases that family members have had. And sometimes they worry about the diseases with which they're most familiar. And sometimes they actually worry about the diseases they just hear other people mention the most. And sometimes those are the diseases that are most likely to affect them, but sometimes they aren't. And stroke happens to be one of those diseases of great concern to menopausal women. And in the case of stroke, it, it's a good thing to have it on your radar because it's a disease for which a lot of postmenopausal women, menopausal women are really at very high risk. So whether or not you've ever given much thought to stroke, please, please, please listen to this podcast because I will make it so that you know what you need to know and know what you can do in order to decrease your risk of stroke. You know, I actually think people use the word stroke a lot, but there are actually very many terms <laughs> for a stroke. And I like to I like to pose quiz questions to just get you thinking about how much you do or don't know about these things that come up in medical parlance all the time and people throw words around, but they don't necessarily know what they mean. So here's a quiz question for you. Other terms for the word stroke include A, cerebrovascular accident, B, cerebral hemorrhage, C, cerebral ischemia, D, cerebral infarct, E, transient ischemic attack, F, lacunar infarct, G, subarachnoid hemorrhage, H, all of the above, I, none of the above. So, what went through your mind with all that? I don't expect you to know all those terms. Are some of them familiar? Are you trying to figure out what the differences are between a hemorrhage and an infarct and ischemia? Do the terms accident and attack sound legitimate to you? You see, most people know one or two of these. But I always try to give you the most complete education I can. And it's important to know that there is more than one term for stroke. So the answer is all of the above. Every single one of those terms that I mentioned means a stroke. Isn't that shocking? Can you believe that so many different terms refer to the very same disease process? Well, now you know that there are a whole lot of words for stroke. Now, you do not need to remember all these terms. Please don't worry about remembering all those terms. What you need to know is that there's a disease process that causes them. And I want you to understand the disease process that causes all of these things that ultimately are a stroke. So let's just get started with that. Now, we've been covering a unit on heart attack, and you might be wondering why in the world I would be discussing stroke, <laughs> right, you know, in the unit on a heart attack. Well, it's because a stroke is really a heart attack in your brain. 
I mean, I know that sounds kind of crazy. You don't have a heart in your brain, but the very same logic you learned about heart attack applies to a stroke. Way back in previous podcasts, I taught you that a heart attack is a roadblock in your arteries that supply your heart. And the roadblock consists of lipids that build up in the walls of the arteries that go to your heart. Well, in the case of stroke, the very same thing happens. The big difference is that instead of having a roadblock in the arteries that go to your heart, the roadblock occurs in the arteries that go to your brain. So in the case of a stroke, lipids build up in the arteries that go to your brain. And those arteries that go to your brain happen to be called carotid arteries. And the reason they're called carotid arteries is because they kind of look like a crown. And the word carotid has something to do with crown. But the result is the same. Anything beyond the roadblock is deprived of blood and oxygen and so it dies. In the case of a stroke, the part of your body that gets deprived of blood and oxygen is your brain. And you know, our brains are really very, very interesting. Did you know that the right side of your brain controls the left side of your body and that the left side of your brain controls the right side of your body? I mean, how twisted is that? Well, you have carotid arteries on both sides of your neck. You have a right carotid artery and you have a left carotid artery. And depending on which side gets blocked, the symptoms of a stroke will vary. If your right carotid artery gets blocked, you'll have a stroke on the right side of your brain but the left side of your body will be affected. And your symptoms will include paralysis on the left side of your body, vision problems, memory loss, and quick and inquisitive behavior. Conversely, if your left carotid artery gets blocked, you will have a stroke on the left side of your brain, but the right side of your body will be affected. And your symptoms will include paralysis on the right side of your body, speech and language problems, memory loss, and very slow, cautious behavior. Of course, you know, you have a whole lot of other arteries going to your brain and any one of them can get blocked. And if they do, your symptoms will vary and not adhere to those strict right versus left sided distinctions that I just made. But here's the real key to it all. All the same things that cause a heart attack cause a stroke. If you're at risk for one, you're at risk for the other. It's a double dose of bad. In previous podcasts, I've given you this long list of risk factors for a heart attack. And guess what? The risk factors for a stroke are exactly the same. They include a previous heart attack or stroke yourself, smoking, high, lousy LDL, low, healthy HDL, a total cholesterol to HDL ratio of greater than four, high triglycerides, obesity, fat in your abdomen, high blood pressure, diabetes, sedentary lifestyle, gum disease, a high homocysteine level, depression, and a family history of heart attack or stroke. All I did with the list is enunciate the whole list of risk factors for a heart attack and write and stroke wherever I said heart attack. And what this means is that the risk calculators that you use to determine your risk for a heart attack also predict your risk for a stroke. And I discussed risk calculators in a previous podcast also.
So if you have a whole lot of risk factors on that list I just enunciated, you don't need a risk calculator to tell you that you're at high risk of stroke. You already know that. But you know, some people just need to convert their risk into a numerical value in order to feel compelled to change their diet and lifestyle or to take a medication. Well, and that's what these risk calculators do. The overlap in heart attacks and stroke also means that the dietary measures you can take to reduce your risk of heart attack also reduce your risk of stroke. And in a previous podcast, I told you all about the low fat dietary options you can adopt to decrease your risk of a heart attack and they work for decreasing your risk of stroke too. The bottom line for this is to eat a 100% plant based diet and plant fats are actually good fats whereas when it comes to your heart and your carotid arteries, animal fats are the worst fats. And then I gave you a podcast on all the high fiber options and it's the very same diet plants. Next I told you all about low sugar options and lowering the sugar in your diet and that's important because sugar is actually stored as fat and that's the fat that clogs your arteries, the fat that is stored. I mean, aren't you glad you're listening to these podcasts in order? <laughs> It just makes connecting the dots so simple. <laughs> After that, I presented all your lifestyle options and they included throwing out your cigarettes, controlling your weight, limiting your alcohol to one drink a day and practicing good dental hygiene. Well, the same management options serve to decrease your risk of stroke too. All the cardiovascular exercises that I've presented in the past kill two diseases with one exercise. I've even given you a whole list of vitamins, minerals, and supplements that decrease clogging of your arteries. They don't know the difference between your heart arteries and your brain arteries, so they'll benefit all of your arteries. And they include calcium and magnesium, more potassium and less sodium, the B vitamins 3, 6, 9, and 12, vitamin C, vitamin E, CoQ10, L-carnitine, and alpha-lipoic acid. Same thing with the herbs that I've shown you and, and talked to you about in previous podcasts. Those included hawthorn, phytoestrogens, red clover, licorice root, hops, and wild yam. I've even given you four different podcasts on multiple aspects of the hormonal medication options, and guess what? All that stuff I told you suffices for strokes as well as heart attacks. If you start taking HRT early in your postmenopause before the aging process has caused your arteries to get hard, it will decrease your risk of stroke or prevent a stroke. But if you start taking HRT late in your postmenopause after your arteries have hardened due to aging, that can actually cause a stroke. This is why you get confused when you hear different information that seems contradictory. One study will say that HRT causes a heart attack or stroke and another will say it decreases a heart attack or stroke. This is why you get confused. It is always really only about the timing and it depends on how much plaque buildup there is already in the arteries of concern. If there's no plaque buildup yet, the HRT can decrease your risk of the plaque buildup and the stroke or heart attack. But if you've already got buildup of plaque in those arteries, it can increase your risk of a heart attack or stroke. Now, I just want to expound just a bit on the research regarding stroke because 